sagittal instability, LOL. Seems like you have some vaginal instability. <laughs> Man. From the Asgard Company Studios in beautiful Wichita Falls, Texas, from the finest mind in the modern fitness industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. Welcome back to Starting Strength Radio. It's Friday, haha. <laughs> And here we are, so predictable, almost to the point of just boring. Every Friday, we come to you with brilliant new content. I've actually been recently made aware of the fact that people are actually watching this for some reason, listening to it. I don't understand it myself, but uh, really the only reason we do this is just to, just to amuse ourselves. I'm here with... Rusty and Bree, hey. and uh, we're uh, we just we're just here having fun. If we weren't recording this, we if we, anyway. we'd be doing it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Read all this shit and talking, but we'd be recording it as just we're recording it just as a uh, uh, um, you know on, on the off chance that maybe you're amused as well. Okay, no Q and A, Q and A. Always useful. Your comments, uh, your questions sent to radio at startingstrength.com. And we, look, look at all these damn things. We're going to talk about as many as we have time for today without straining your attention span. But first, comments, comments from, from the haters. The haters. These are always fun. Mario Molnar says, this is in res with respect to the Game Changers show, the piece of vegan propaganda that we dismantled several weeks ago. And I want you to, I want you to look at how handily he dismisses our critique. Mario says, yep, just the circle jerk that I expected. Just do a debate, PPL. Stroking each other's bias brings nothing to the table. Especially if we disagree with your vegetable eating ass, Mario. <laughs> okay. Bodhi Fitness says, was ready to dig into an awesome new podcast called Starting Strength until I heard your weak ass critique of the game changers, and then this. God, man, grow up. Learn a bit before you use your platform to spew shit. And look up the goddamn blue zones, for fuck's sake. What is a blue zone? I have no idea what a blue zone is. I didn't look it up. I'm, Let's, should I'm, we look it up real quick? No. Okay. Right. Damn, these people are the picture of health. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we do okay. You're still alive. We're still sitting here. Boop, 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 <laughs> boop, boop. I saw you deadlift 500. You like, saw me deadlift. A year ago. Uh, yeah, a couple of years ago. Here, Denarius Shekels says, yeah, I just come here for comment S form the haters and advice on gaining strength. I need nutritional advice from Rip as much as I need hairstyle advice from Santana. <laughs> now that that one's pretty yeah, funny. That's funny. That's good. <laughs> that one's actually pretty funny. <laughs> look at how literally unhealthy these three look. Because you can always tell by looking, right? All of them, all of them overweight and struggle to gulp air. <laughs> Santana, yeah, he's he's overweight. Yeah. Uh, God. when these guys flop over because of a metabolic disease, 
or cardiovascular disease, they will finally get the point of a vegan diet. So if you, you're a ve- if you're a vegan, you'll live forever. You'll never have a heart attack. I, you know, you're making a critical mistake here, wow. Rusty. You're you you enjoy these yeah. for what they are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't try to. Just, uh, use them as a spring point for reasoning. No, you. That's, that, that's a, that one hurt my brain a little bit. That's why. All right, Grissol says sagittal instability. LOL. Seems like you have some vaginal instability. <laughs> Man. It rhymes. That's why. Uh, yeah, it is. Kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> and that's it for. Comments, Comments from, from uh, the, the heaters. heaters. Oh, oh, that's my favorite part of the favorite part of the week. I did like that last one. That last one was fun. The vaginal, yeah, sagittal. It yeah, it's kind of it's good. It's all right. Let's ask some questions of Rip, some actual ones, and let Rip provide some answers, shall we? Here's a big, long, stupid-looking thing here that I actually took the time to read a minute ago and highlighted a couple of things. And the guy says, I was a dumbass in my early 20s and took pro-hormones, which shut down my testosterone. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, He also developed type 2 diabetes. Says his mother died from type 1. They're probably not related events. Last year, I brought a rack and weights. Let's see. Finally had the test levels. 400 pounds. The weight ballooned up from 205 to 285, and he's only 5'5". Five five. Uh, and he's blaming it on the pro-hormones. He's a chubby little fucker, isn't he? I don't mind. 5'5", 285? That's a. That's like why that's is he a, as tall? The round mound of the ground. This is all the fault of the pro hormones, obviously. What are your thoughts on the volume? And I'll be able to progress as older and I don't want to talk about that shit. All right, can you speak about the pro hormone problem? All right, he's talking about DHEA and all this other stuff. Look. Taking that kind of shit does not shut down permanently your testosterone production. Nothing shuts permanently down your testosterone production except castration. Don't do that and you'll be okay. All right? Don't get castrated. Don't let the animal rescue people extend their control over the rest of society by castrating you. They want everybody castrated. All males should be castrated. That's the, the, uh, yeah, I'm convinced that that is the primary reason for the resistance to testosterone replacement therapy is because winding through society right now, there is a, uh, there is a sentiment that equates testicles with Everything that is bad. Now, there are women who will tell you that. There are men who will agree with them. You know why men agree with those women? They're trying to get laid. And it's not <laughs> that's, how they, that's how they think they're going to get laid, and it's not working. That never works. That's... Why they're saying yeah. that is because they have testicles. They, the reason they say that is because they think they're gonna they're they're gonna turn it to their advantage yeah. to be sympathetic, so they get to use their testicles <laughs> once this year. Maybe in their life. Yeah. All right. I've been enjoying watching past YouTube videos in which you're featured. I recently watched the series you recorded with the Art of Manliness, our friend Brett McKay up in Tulsa. You made an interesting comment when you mentioned that you believe that the bench press is an overrated movement as compared to the press. You went on to give many reasons why the press was a superior exercise. Could one conclude from your assertion that a trainee could make better use of his training time by only training the press? Oh, we've we've talked about this so many times, but it's been a while since it came up, so I thought I'd go ahead and, and 
Look, the reason the bench press is in the program, there's a very good reason the bench is in the is in the program because the bench press makes your upper body stronger than the press. It's a completely different direction to pull. The kinetic chain is shorter. You can handle a lot more weight on the bench than you can on the press unless you specialize on the press. Now, if you want to specialize on the press, you go ahead. Fine with me. If you do that, you're going to press four days a week, and you're going to have to use the bench press in a, as an assistance exercise on one of those days. You, you don't quit benching. But a press specialist presses four days a week. This is the way it's done. And if, you've, if you want to do that, that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, I don't like the idea of floppy pecs on a man. I don't think that that, I don't think that looks particularly good. And most girls don't like the way that looks either. Um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, this obsession with pec development is a, is a, is a bad thing too. That's a result of, uh, the past 30 years of the approach to bodybuilding. But, um, I think that, uh, I think you ought to have a little tone in your pecs. I think you ought to bench, uh, the, the bench becomes a problem once you've had several shoulder injuries. Bench is hard on injured shoulders. Most people find that they can fix that with uh, close grips. You just move into a close grip bench and just do all your benches with a close grip, and it usually takes most of the stress off the shoulders. Uh, but if you can bench press, I think you ought to bench press. And uh, but, but if you're just not interested in doing it for whatever reason, it's your program. It's not mine. I just think you'll be stronger if you bench in terms of your upper body since you can handle heavier weights. Here's a guy named Joseph. He's, he says, uh, recently you made a video trashing, literally, because we put it in the dumpster, mm-hmm. right? The trap bar deadlift calling out the U.S. Army for utilizing it in their new fitness test, the ACFT. Your arguments are flawed. Not because you're wrong about the trap bar, but because you misunderstand the purpose of the ACFT. Most people in the Army would agree that the barbell deadlift is superior. The ACFT isn't a meet, though. It's an assessment used by leaders to measure their subordinates' fitness, which helps gauge unit readiness. Trap bar deadlift can be taught to soldiers at any level of experience with a lower chance of injury. This is a stupid statement. This is a stupid statement, all right? I think I demonstrated that the inherent instability in the trap bar creates a greater safety hazard than does the deadlift. And as far as teaching soldiers at any level of experience the deadlift and to assert that the deadlift has a higher chance of injury than the trap bar deadlift indicates that you don't don't know what the fuck you're talking about, all right? We teach groups of people to deadlift every month at the seminar. We've been doing this for 15 years. We've never had an injury in the groups of people we teach, some of them having never deadlifted before. It's five steps. It takes three minutes to show somebody how to do a correct deadlift. Three minutes. And if you can't learn to teach the simplest barbell exercise in the book, then you have no business teaching anybody anything anyway. The deadlift is the easiest of the five major barbell exercises to learn. And I'm sorry, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? That's that's, that's just, you know, to have people just make statements like that, that they have absolutely no experience with evaluating the veracity of is, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's why you guys are all still running two miles. You know, you, you don't do anything that involves a two mile run, but nonetheless, everybody has to run two miles. Think. And if you don't know, ask. Okay. I teach the deadlift. I've taught it for 40 years. I know how to teach the deadlift and I can teach you how to teach the deadlift very, very quickly and easily. If you'll just ask me. Okay. All right. 
Uh, I wanted to ask your opinion about hack squat and Jefferson deadlift as accessories. Could they have any place in an advanced or intermediate training program? Since they're not mentioned in the book, I assume you don't care for them. Could you explain why? Sure. Sure, Jordan. I'll be glad to explain why. The hack squat is uh, it's, it's two things, all right? There's a thing called a hack squat machine. And in a hack squat machine, it's kind of like the opposite of a leg press. Because instead of your legs moving up and down, you're laying against a carriage where your body moves up and down with your feet planted. This is not good because it does not allow for hip movement in the sagittal plane. All right, it doesn't allow your hips to do, to adjust so that they're doing the work. It's a quad thing. It's terribly hard on your knees. But it is a machine, and uh, it's easy to teach. See, machines are easy to teach, too, not just deadlifts, right? Uh, so I don't like the machine version of the hack squat. The, the actual barbell version of the hack squat is incredibly difficult to execute. You take the bar out of a rack behind you. In other words, you walk up to the bar with your hands behind your so your your butt is to the bar. You grab the, the bar and you walk out of the rack with it and you squat down with the bar in your hands with it behind you. Now, if you can actually figure out how to do that with 500 pounds, I want you to send me a video, all right? And I'll send you some money. I'll send you more money than you think I'll send you if you can actually do that with any weight at all. The fact is you can't, and if you can't do it with heavy weight, why do the damn thing? What are, what are we trying to do here? Get strong? Well, we squat and we deadlift, and that's how we get strong because we don't need to do bizarre things with the barbell that prevent us from lifting heavy weights and thus getting stronger, all right? So the hack squat with a barbell is a ridiculous idea. It always has been a ridiculous idea. That's why you never have seen it done in a gym. People do the most ridiculous shit in the world in a commercial gym. And you have never seen anybody do a hack squat with a bar. Now, have you? No, you haven't. Now, Jefferson's, uh, I was taught to do Jefferson's. And I've, you know, I've used them on occasion. But again, they're an assistance exercise and they're just not necessary. They are also asymmetrical. They're an asymmetrical assistance exercise, which means that if you're going to be symmetrical, you got to do half of the set with the right foot forward and half of the set with the left foot forward and switch your grip. I don't see the purpose in them. Again, they can't be done heavy. If you've got any kind of back problems at all, they're a really, really bad idea because they asymmetrically load the back. Don't asymmetrically load your back if you've got back problems, okay? Hi, Rip. First off, thank you, thank you for all that you've done for the strength community. Well, that's sweet, Eric. You're a very nice man. I spent all of my 20s, most of my 30s, frittering my potential gains in the gym away using less than optimal methods of exercising, thinking it was training. I'm grateful you took the time to originally write uh, both the blue and gray books with your collaborators and that you continue the refinement process to this day by using what you observe in trainees, novices, and advanced lifters alike. Uh, I was somewhat surprised by the outrage expressed on the internet and social media with respect to your recent video uh, about the trap bar. I thought you made reasonable points with respect to the idea that there are more economical ways to build strength by using a straight barbell. What I see on the internet is Rip is a clown. Fuck Rip. And Rip's fat. What else do they say? Rip's, Rip's unhealthy. Rip can't breathe. Rip has heart disease. Rip can't see his dick. Rip's a butthole. I hate Rip. Right. With no attempt made to repudiate anything you said. Well, no. As I thought about the video, I 
feel like it is very Trumpian in nature and that it helps to illustrate who the charlatans are. And, of course, your video actually starts a conversation about this topic. That is an interesting observation because the typical pattern we see, and we, you know, read the comments from the haters, is just to get on and start type illegibly about shit that has got no actual bearing on reality. You know, uh, you know our, our, for example, our treatment of the Game Changers veg and propaganda film, our treatment of that was just, uh, you know, it's just confirmation bias. We need to have a real debate instead of actually just sitting here telling each other we're right, you know. Uh, it's fascinating to me uh, that nobody refuted what we said, you know. Nobody's refuted what we said. And and in 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 reality, the, the Game Changers is an excellent example of this. You The thing is so slick. And so well produced and so well edited and written and photographed that you just drink it in. You just drink it in. Well, that's what's designed to have done. Like Lenny Riefenstahl, you just drink the propaganda in. You don't question anything. You just you just accept without thinking. Here we had a rather long discussion about it. We asked you to think about it. We pointed out the logical inconsistencies. And all you fucking idiots can say is, Rip's fat. Rip can't breathe. <laughs> uh, Eric, um, as I've pointed out many times, the bell curve of intelligence peaks at 100. That's the top of the bell curve. All right, we are narrow casting. We've said this thousands of times as well. And I'm sorry that these people can't understand what we're trying to tell them, but they can't, and I can't make them understand. I can't, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you, right? You may have seen that recently. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a damn shame, but this is just, you know, uh, we're going to win, all right, because we're right. We're going to win. And you don't beat us by saying, ribs fit. You know, that doesn't win. Now all the comments are going to say ribs fit. Ribs fit. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, that's so... You know, I, I I appreciate your concern, Eric. I really do. I, you're absolutely correct in this observation. And uh, I wish they would up their game. But they haven't. And they won't because they can't. Uh, hi, Mark. I'm starting to strength train for the first time. Very limited previous experience with weights. Learning a lot from your books. Uh, 56, 6'4", 360. Previous surgery at L4-5. Back's okay today, though. I am unable to do body weight squats, so I'm using a leg press machine. I've worked my way up from 270 to 400 over the past couple of months. Chuck! Chuck, my friend, don't do that. Okay, now let's think for a minute about what position a leg press puts your back in and where the load is going. All right, you've had surgery at L4-5. All right, normal anatomical position for your low back is lordotic extension, right? You understand what I mean by that? You've got a slight curve in your low back in that direction. Here's your belly. There's your butt, all right? And your low back is curved like that. All right, now what happens when you lay down in the leg press machine? Your, your low back, well, I can't move my hand that way. But your low back is in goes into flexion. That turns this way, and you are laid back over like that. This is the way your back needs to be loaded. This is a squat. This is a deadlift. This is normal anatomical position. Your muscles hold your back in normal anatomical position, 
and the back muscles transfer force. But if you are laying down on your lumbar spine in flexion with a bunch of weight mashing you down into the pad, this is just an excellent way to hurt your back again. Don't do that. And I don't believe for a second that a guy that's leg pressing 400 pounds at a body weight of anything can't squat. I don't believe that. I think you just haven't done it yet. If you need to get some help, get some help. You're grown up. You've got the money to hire a coach. Uh, go somewhere and let somebody help you learn how to squat. And come to Wichita Falls, we'll take care of it here for you. Okay? But don't don't leg press on a on back surgery. That's a real dumb idea. And I know it sounds – it, it to the to the casual observer, the deadlift and the squat look like they'd be more dangerous for the low back than the leg press. But I am not a casual observer, and I'm telling you that the leg press is a real bad idea. All right, so take that into consideration, please. All right, uh, dear Rip, I'm 23, been strength training seriously for three years. He's 6'2", 215, deadlifted 350. Squats 315, benches 235. Uh, had your body weight been higher than that, you'd been handling better numbers than this. I know I need to gain about 12, 15, 25 pounds. Well, he knows anyway. To be as strong as I want to be, but I always start to feel sick above 220. High blood pressure. You have high blood pressure? Is that what you're telling me? You have high blood pressure? At the age of 23? Uh, healthy? training you got you're hypertensive at the age of, I, it could happen but that's probably not true all right most males in my family died in their 50s of heart issues i really want to accomplish impressive feats of strength but not sure how do i go about this there's a type of diet or conditioning that can help me maintain a higher bmi safely or am i just doomed thanks for your time i don't know why you think Connor, that you're doomed because you have a higher BMI. If you're in shape, I mean, look, you could die when you're 45. You know, if your familial genetics are not optimum, you may not get to be real old. But having gotten strong and in shape is not going to contribute to early death. That's not the way shit works, man. Uh you know, I, it, you, you can listen to these people tell you that a heavy muscular body weight's bad for your heart. That's not true. Occasionally, big, strong, athletic guys in similar familial situations to yours die. Occasionally, it's, you know, they'll die without, without you know, an ostensible reason for having done so. But I think if you look a little more closely you'll probably find that they were abusing something they shouldn't have been abusing. And that always comes with a price. But there, look, man, there's no guarantee. I'd fall over dead before the end of this podcast today. And if that's what's going to happen, it's what's going to happen. But it won't be uh, the result of my having trained or dieted incorrectly. I'll be 64 here pretty quick. And I'm in decent shape for a 64-year-old guy. You know, the, it's, it's, just not, uh, it's just not true that lifting weights is bad for you. So get that, out of your, get that out of your mind. I don't know that you – you may be hypertensive at the age of 23. If you've been dealt that bad a, a hand, I'm sorry. You need to get it dealt with and keep it under control. But uh, – the training itself is not going to hurt you, all right? Being 225, 235 in body weight at 6'2 is a healthy body weight. It's a normal, healthy body weight for an athletic man. So stop worrying, train correctly, gain some muscular weight, and have a good time while you're here. Also, BMI is completely worthless. BMI for a person that trains yeah. is... Is, is utterly pointless. Everybody already knows that. So Here's a gentleman by the name of Davidus. Gulbinus. What kind of name is that, you think? Is 
that his actual name Sounds is. What, what it looks like it is. Interesting. I wonder if I ask Davidus where he's from, if I'm being racially insensitive. I don't think so. You don't think I am? Well, I better not, though. All right. Uh, Utah talk quite often about genetic athletic potential, and I'd be interested if you could expand on this. What numbers could male natural lifters expect on the bar in their peak years, say after 10 years of barbell training, provided they know what they're doing and do not waste their time or effort in the gym? I understand that this will vary with the individual, but it would be interesting if you could shed a light on this and perhaps talk about how the bell curve a vertical jump might translate into natural limits of the main lifts. Okay. Man, you're correct in, in, in making the observation that it varies with the individual. All of the things that contribute to your physical potential uh, are going to be the things that determine your ultimate performance. Now, you'll notice I didn't say genetic potential. Because that's just one aspect of physical potential. All right, genetic potential is uh, is useful if we postulate that all of the other variables in developing your physical ability are optimized, and this doesn't happen. All right, uh, you may have the genetics that permit a 38-inch vertical jump. People with big verticals start off stronger and always are stronger than people with small genetics. That's because the vertical jump is a direct measurement of how many motor units you've got in your recruitment right this minute in a very short period of recruitment time. Uh, people like that are more neuromuscularly efficient than people with low verticals. They'll always be able to produce more muscular force because they can call more muscle mass into contraction. All right. Now, that having been said, kid walks around with 38-inch vertical potentials and becomes a crack addict. I guess we're not going to see a great deal of physical performance from him. You know, he can put up with it for a little while, but these people always burn out real quick. Whereas a guy with, uh, you know, average physical potential like me, quite average, you know, physical potential, got up to 633 deadlift just because I was stubborn and wouldn't fucking stop, right? Uh, it, it is almost pointless to talk about this. And, you know, if you look on our website, we still have those – strength standards up. I regretted putting those up. I regretted even making the chart up shortly after I did it because people misinterpret what it means. And they're almost impossible to use. But everybody, I try, I took them down. We had them down off the website for years. And then everybody else was putting them up. And they were, after all, ours. So we, you know, grudgingly replaced them on the website. But everybody still misuses them, you know. What we're trying to do with that is, is what you wanted us to do. How long, If I've been training X amount of years and I'm this big, what should I be lifting? You should be lifting as much as you can, all right? And what's going to control that are all the variables that are involved, the ones you don't have any control over, which are your genetics, and the ones you do have control over, your ability to train effectively, the amount of time that you can spend correctly training, the amount of time you can spend in proper recovery, the way you eat, the way you sleep, the way you recreate, all of these things that, that you have direct control over have to be optimized as well. But if your dog dies, if you get sick, you get the flu, you're in a car wreck, you know, you're, you get thrown off the building by a jealous husband, you know, it's all kind of things that, that have a bearing on your ability to reach your physical potential. And genetics is just one of those things. So it's not really useful to talk about genetic capacity in the absence of the considerations, uh, that you must bring to the training. All right. You, you, uh, 
you'll find that a lot of the genetically gifted people that have had it easy, you know, that are that were, you know, on the football team. They're playing varsity football their freshman year. That those kind of guys. Uh, they they tend to not last long because if it comes easy to you, you're a genetic freak, and it comes easy to you. You quite often don't learn that you have to do things you'd rather not do in order to get something accomplished at some point. And I I think that this is probably one of the big reasons that Division I and pro sports teams are so thoroughly bought in to functional training. It's easier than actual than actual strength training. It's much easier than actual strength training, and it, it fits right in with the model that uh, uh, that they have developed, that, hey, this isn't that hard for me. I'm good at this. I think I'll just keep doing it this way. When, you know, coming into the gym and adding five pounds of workout to an already 475-pound squad, hell, that's hard. You've know, never, never had to work hard before because it's come easy to me. A big genetic endowment is certainly uh, a uh, a good thing to have, but it can also be a handicap to the wrong guy, right? Brandon writes, would you mind talking more about the factors you consider when a client is stuck? All right, well, the most important things to consider when a client is stuck Uh, And if you are working with a client in person, they shouldn't be stuck for these reasons because you're in charge of them and you ought to to have the article on the website called The First Three Questions. You ought to have that memorized, all right? Most people get stuck for three reasons. The first and most important reason is that they are not resting long enough between their work sets. This is, this is so, it, it's ubiquitous. It's utterly, absolutely, always the first assumption that you make if someone is stuck uh, on incremental progression on their work sets because everybody thinks for one reason or another that you're supposed to go quickly between sets that if you get cold or that you catch your breath, you're not optimizing the workout. You, you, please try to understand this, okay? If you are conditioning, that's a different thing than strength training. If you are strength training, you wait long enough between the work sets, that you are completely recovered from the fatigue of the previous work set before you get under the bar for the next one. Because the most important rep of three sets of five is the last rep of the last set of five. If you miss that, you're stuck. What easy thing can you do to not miss that? Rest enough between the end of the second set in the beginning of the third set to optimize your chances of making the last rep of the last set of five. We're training for strength. In other words, the weight on the bar has to go up. If the weight on the bar quits going up, you're stuck. And if you're stuck for something stupid, like you didn't rest but two minutes between the, between your work sets, Well, you're unnecessarily stuck, and you've created a problem for yourself that is easily solved by resting 5 or 6 or 10 or 12 minutes or 20 minutes, if necessary, between the work sets. You get up to where you're doing five sets of five across with 455, you may find that you need to rest 20 minutes between these sets because they're real hard. But if you can get the fifth rep of the fifth set, then you can go up a little more next time, and now we're still training, okay? Uh, Second problem we see, this is to recap the article called The First Three Questions. The second thing we see is that you're trying to take too big an incremental jump 
between workouts on the lift in question. Uh, if you are trying to take five pound jumps on your bench press or your press after a couple of months of training, you're going to get stuck. Your, your upper body can't adapt that quickly. You can't go up five pounds of workout. And if you can't go up five pounds of workout and you try to, you're going to be stuck. That's what stuck means. All right. If you're, in other words, if you're not set up to take smaller jumps, in other words, if you don't have the plates to load a one and a half pound increase on the press, then you don't have enough equipment. Typically people carry, if they're training in, their, in, in a commercial gym, they carry, if the gym doesn't provide it, we do of course, but if you are training in a gym doesn't provide it, you got to get your own micro plates and carry them into the gym and your gym bag. That's your responsibility. Okay. You're training at home. It's no big deal. You just have that as part of your set, but you have to have the ability to take the appropriate jumps between, between work sets in an exercise where the progress is coming harder. Okay. And then the third question we always, we always ask is, are you eating enough? If you're trying to do a cut and, and try to get strong at the same time, on 2,200 calories a day, well, you're not getting recovered. You're just not getting recovered between the work sets, between the workouts, rather. And if you're not getting recovered, you're not going to not going to adapt. Stress, recovery, adaptation, right? Recovery must be facilitated. You're not sleeping enough. You're not eating enough. And I understand that there are circumstances in life that prohibit complete recovery. The circumstances within your control need to be under your control. You may only be getting six hours of sleep a night. You may have to work. I understand. That's just sometimes that's what you have to do, but you can't eat more if you just will, right? To a certain extent, food makes up for a lack of sleep. That works for a while, all right? But if you're not eating enough and you're not getting enough sleep, well, you're not going to make any progress. It's just all there is to it. Uh, so you've got to, to understand that these are so frequently the causes of getting stuck that if you don't ask those first three questions, you're just not, you're not, you know, thinking about this correctly. It's usually something you can fix. Funny story he has. I'm at the dock getting my annual the other day I don't understand the purpose of that but maybe it's required for work we're chatting away when he's checking this and that he puts his hand on my arm and with his serious doctor face he asks if I'm taking steroids because they're dangerous and if I am we need to have a talk about it I'm not but I don't think I have ever received a better compliment in my physical experience at least from a man Brandon, everybody that's in shape and got that way doing our program has gained a lot of muscle, and the assumption's always going to be that you're on steroids because, of course, there's no way to make the kind of progress that you've made unless you're on steroids. Now, who do you have to thank for that attitude? The media. The media is who you have to thank for that attitude. I've recently come to the conclusion that the people that work in the media – or even more stupid than high school coaches, if that's possible. And I understand I may be alienating some people, but I don't mind doing that. You might have noticed. Okay, Eric asks, what is the rationale behind this obsession with joint mobility? I assume they're referring to flexibility, but I fail to see the advantage in the absence of a sport like gymnastics. My brother's an Olympic lifter and often complains about having to work on hip mobility. Eric, that's an excellent question. And uh, I, uh, I think that as a general observation, we should, uh, we should state that the fitness community, the fitness industry, this whole thing we do is – subject to 
so much bullshit that it makes it it, it makes it real hard to to have an honest conversation about so much of the stuff we do. You've got the very, very, very low quality of exercise science. It's as bad as nutrition science. Uh, and an industry without any any decent underpinning is uh, is is going to have these kinds of problems. It's going to be full of misinformation and hearsay and innuendo and rumor and and tradition and because this is the way we do it kind of explanations this this sort of shit uh for a long time the the fitness industry has has incorporated stretching as a uh, uh this is not just recently this has been for 50 years stretching posters have been around a long time and People wanting you to stretch and putting your body in uncomfortable positions. These things were considered to be good. And if if you'll if you'll think for a minute why stretching was considered to be good, it readily becomes apparent that since stretching is uncomfortable, it must be good. Because what is uncomfortable is good. Penance, right? That sort of thing. Penance. And uh, I don't know uh, where this all started, but the idea is just almost universally accepted that the more flexible, more greater the range of motion around a joint you have, which is largely controlled by the extensibility of the muscles that control that range of motion, then the better that is. Uh, I mean, this is, people won't even argue with you about this. They, nobody asks why. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. Why is it important to have, uh, why is joint mobility beyond what is required for your training and your sports performance desirable? You know, and we talked about yoga on a little clip we made the other day, and you should see the comments from the haters on that it's just you know not one of them said why they just said ribs fat <laughs> ribs fat ribs stupid he can't even stand up rip can't walk you know this sort of shit and all i'm saying is if your uh brother the olympic lifter complains about having to work on his hip mobility how mobile do you have to be to catch a front squat, to rack a, a squat clean? You have to be pretty damn extensible, pretty damn flexible. I'm just, I don't like the word mobility. Mobility is what happens when you get a car. Okay. Uh, when, when you are flexible enough to rack an overhead squat, the bottom of a snatch if you're flexible enough to do that you're you're sufficiently flexible to do the movement why do you need to be flexible beyond that i don't see a point in it and what is the primary thing that's going to ensure the flexibility of the full squat snatch well doing the the snatch as a practice movement you're practicing the the movement pattern, you're practicing the range of motion required for the movement pattern every time you perform one. And if you lack mobility, mobility is provided by doing the movement pattern. I don't see any point in getting any more flexible than is necessary for you to do an overhead squat if you're an Olympic lifter. Uh, you know, I, it, 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 if, if you're engaged in a sport that that uses the ends of normal human extensibility and range of motion, then th those kind of things are important to warm up. Those kinds of things need to be warmed up correctly so that you don't hurt yourself getting into that position cold. But a whole bunch of work on that position, I think, is provided by actually doing the practicing the movement itself. 
if you're not sufficiently flexible in the shoulders and in the hips to rack an overhead squat, uh, you may find it necessary to stretch. And a lot of people have found that they can get that way with stretching if that's your if that's the sport in question. But if you've got to the point where you can't get sufficiently flexible to rack an overhead squat, it might be it might be useful if you would start thinking outside the box and maybe consider doing a split snatch as an Olympic lifter. There are ways around this. You can do a split snatch. A lot of masters lifters ought to be doing split snatches and, in fact, split cleans. Instead of doing uh, the full squat versions of those two movement patterns. But, you know, it's just something to consider. Uh, it might solve some problems for you. But the but the the obsession with with flexibility is is it, it's especially interesting considering the fact that there's a been a lot of research done on the effects of stretching and power production and every one of those studies has shown the same thing if you stretch before you do explosive movements your power production goes down every time without exception and uh i I don't know if you look at all of the all the research on stretching it doesn't reduce soreness it doesn't prevent soreness uh it reduces power production i just i just don't see a point in it I really don't. And the minute you stop seeing a point in it, your workouts get shorter. If you're training people, if you learn to train them without stretching them first, the, the, the appointment is short. They don't need it anyway. They don't benefit from it. So, you know, stop acting like they do because they don't. Okay. Here's an interesting question. How difficult is it to be, to become a starting strength coach? What's the best way to make a living as an SSC, assuming I want to coach full-time? Well, starting current coaches uh, are working in this industry, and they command a higher amount of money per appointment than uh, most other people in the industry. If you're, if you're in a big, major market, you're in New York City, you're in L.A., you're in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, What's a la dee da? You're in Paris. Say so you're in. Do, do French so, people, do they spring train? I don't know. I don't think they do. I, think they, I think they just smoke yeah, and eat little cakes. Yeah. You know. Uh, Wear ascots. You know. But they, uh, uh, if, if, you're in a, if you're a hot personal trainer in New York City, you're making $500 an hour, maybe more than that. Uh, but. That is a rather artificial market situation. Uh, starting strength coaches make a lot of money because they always provide results for their clients. The high-end $500 an hour guys in Dallas that have you doing leg extensions, you just want to be seen with them. That's a whole different activity. Our coaches provide value. And as a result, they're compensated for it. Uh, we are growing, boys and girls. I, I want you to understand uh, our web traffic is up. Uh, our business in the store is up. We're selling a lot more books. Every month is getting quite a bit better. This is finally catching on. We are finally penetrating with the idea that simple, incremental increases in the basic barbell movements are the most productive way to spend time and money in a gym. People are responding to this argument. People like the fact that I don't sit here and lie to you about what I think or what is right. On this podcast, people are responding to the idea that old-fashioned arithmetical logic is, is the basis of our analysis. And there, you know, people that, that, that value that kind of thing are drawn to our approach. There's a market for you as a starting strength coach. And to become a starting strength coach requires experience in coaching the method. 
Now, this is obviously starts with you reading the books and learning what the method is. And then a lot of people have become coaches on their own, just out of their own volitional capacity for self-improvement by doing it, by taking on a client, teaching them how to squat, learning from doing and accumulating enough experience to come to the starting strength seminar and get certified as the starting strength coach. At that point, you're allowed to use our trademarks and we license you the use of the trademarks. We put you up on the website and you get business. People contact you as a starting strength coach where they contact nobody else who has any other certification. We, our starting strength coaches are contacted all the time about, about them working as a starting strength coach for a new client. If you are interested, we have a coaching development course available on this website. Uh, look it up. Uh, after you've read the books, this is a basically a guided course of study that helps you get through the process of becoming a starting strength coach. The primary bottleneck that you're going to have with passing the starting strength coach evaluation is your experience on the platform with fixing problems that you encounter during the coaching of barbell training. There's no shortcut for this. There's no way to hand you experience. You have to gain it for yourself. And you gain it by getting some people to teach, teaching them correctly, learning from what you did wrong, reinforcing the things you did right, and becoming a better coach. When you come to a starting strength seminar to be examined as a starting strength coach, you, you're already there. We don't make coaches at weekend seminars. We are not like the rest of the industry. That's not what we do. We determine whether or not you're already a starting strength coach at a starting strength seminar. That's why you're coming to the seminar. Now, people come to the seminars have absolutely no intention of ever becoming a coach they just come to learn but at the seminar is where you're evaluated and you're not going to get to the point where you can pass that evaluation if you're not already there when you show up uh you know there's a lot of stuff on the website about this there's lots and lots of help we need people we need good people to carry this credential because there's a demand right now that we can't fill so demand is in excess of supply this is a real good economic situation to be in if you can provide that supply and you want to be in this business this is the way to do it and ours is the certification to obtain well let's see that's probably a good place to stop why don't we just go away now I got some stuff I need to do, and you do too. We'll see you next time right here at Starting Strength Radio. Thanks for watching.